Well, a very good evening and welcome to our service here at Stone Market. It's good to be together on the evening of the Lord's Day and it's lovely to just think about God's great mercy and grace shown to us. And we pray that as we gather tonight, he will look upon us with love and mercy and grace and reveal himself to us through the scriptures. And even as the sun shines in, isn't that just a reminder of God's great promises? Well, we're going to start with reading from the Word of God, but it's quite a sad chapter, really. It's Genesis chapter 4. And uh, although it's a sad chapter, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and that's the most important thing. So let's read together Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. Well, thankfully that's not the end of the story, (laughs) and we're going to learn about that in Hebrews this evening. But, uh, well, what a sad start to the first brothers that God had created in this world. Let's come to the Lord in prayer, let's pray together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that on this Sunday evening we can gather together for worship and praise of our great Awesome, almighty, sovereign, powerful God. O Lord, we do love you, but help us to love you more. We do want to learn from you this evening, and we do pray that you'll give Daniel the help that he needs to open up the scriptures to us. But Lord, we are reminded from this story that we do live in a fallen world. And many, like Cain, have wandered away from God and established godless societies. We see all around us people, towns, places where they don't want anything to do with God. We will not have this man all over us, people say. And so they are left to their own devices. But we are reminded that those who call upon the Lord will be saved. There is grace for all who call upon him. And this world needs the gospel. And we thank you for the recent conference of the GBM missionaries and their families who met together and were encouraged in the work of Grace Baptist Mission and encouraged to go back to the places and the countries they've come from to take the good news of the gospel out into all the world. Lord, we thank you, thank you for others like Asia Link and Murph. And, oh Lord, we are encouraged this evening to know that your word is still powerful, it is still mighty, it is still saving souls, and it is reaching out to every corner of the earth. So, Lord, continue, we pray, to do a great work in spreading the good news of the gospel. We also want to pray for that young man, Aaron, who... Uh, Spoke to Daniel last week and we do pray that as he, coming from a, uh, a Jewish background and wants to know and learn about the gospel, Lord, that he will be 
excited by your spirit. You will be encouraged by your word and come to want to join us here at Stone Market and learn about the amazing salvation that can only be find, found in the, uh, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we pray that you will work in his heart and we long that many would come to Jesus in these days. So as we look at this chapter of faith in Hebrews later on, and as we are reminded that anyone calling upon you can be saved by faith. Oh Lord, we love to think of that repetition in that lovely chapter of by faith, by faith, by faith, men and women came to Jesus. May it happen here tonight. So Lord, may your word do us good and may we draw close to you and we know that you have promised that you will draw close to us. Speak to every heart here tonight, young and old. Oh Lord, we long that each one would come to know and love you. So we ask for your presence and your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we're going to sing and Daniel will introduce the hymns.
please grab a Bible and turn to the book of Hebrews. Uh, we'll be uh, going through Hebrews 11 over the next four weeks to sort of match that faith that we see in, in Genesis in the morning. And uh, that's on page 1,381 of the Pew Bibles. We'll be looking at the first three uh, men that are mentioned, but we'll begin in verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 39, uh, since it is the context. Here we go. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Well, keep that open in front of you. We're going to sing one final time before we come in here. From God's word, we're going to stand and sing, trust and obey.
Please turn back in the Bibles to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and let's just pray and ask for God's help as we come to His Word. Our gracious Father in heaven, we pray that you would give us Christ this evening as He is clothed in the gospel. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in 2017, I had the opportunity to head over to Greece and Turkey uh, with my Bible college. And uh, we had the privilege of looking at the New Testament world. And so, you know, there were plenty of sites. We went to Corinth and Athens and Ephesus and Antioch. And there were really loads of sites that opened up the world of the Bible. And I remember walking through Ephesus and entering a museum. And uh, all of the history was brought to life. In the museum, there sat perfectly preserved busks or statues of Roman emperors, lots of them. Uh, Some of them wore head coverings, which uh, symbolized their priestly status. And you can somewhat imagine what it would have been like walking past these statues in the early church. Uh, Maybe intimidating. Uh, The emperors were held up as the greats of the day, weren't they? It would sort of be like walking through the National Portrait Gallery gallery in London. I'm not sure if you've ever been. Uh, If you have, you would have walked past paintings of Wilberforce and Churchill. These were the heroes of their day. Uh, All the greats are there, and that gallery is meant to bring it all to life. Well, in much the same way, the, the chapter we're in this evening paints the portrait gallery for the heroes of faith, and it culminates in the most remarkable portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the author here takes us from creation to Christ, doesn't he? It climaxes with the supreme hero, the founder and perfecter of faith, the one who endured the cross. See, Jesus had a faith that endured. And in Hebrews, we're exhorted to look at the final picture in the gallery. You've probably read the, well, you might have read the whole chapter before, uh, but all of these pictures really illustrate the faith that perseveres, doesn't it? That's what we need in the Christian life, a faith that perseveres. Uh, The author of Hebrews has been talking about faith, and he says at the end of chapter 10, doesn't he, we're those who have faith and are not destroyed. So you and I need a faith that perseveres, a faith that doesn't shrink back. You know, it's no good sprinting at the start of the Christian faith, only to pull out halfway through. So many people do that, don't they? I've met many enthusiastic beginners who sprinted faster than anyone, only to find it too difficult when push comes to shove, and now they've given up before they even really got going. Hebrews says we must press on in the faith if we're to make it. And these portraits are here to help and encourage us. And here they they nudge us on along the way. And Hebrews 11 begins with a brilliant summary, doesn't it? It's a famous line. It hangs over the rest of the chapter. It's a summary of faith. Have a look at verse 1. The author says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The author of Hebrews spells out the character of faith. In a word, we could say that faith is certitude. It's a dynamic certainty about what God has promised he will do. And notice it's not a feeling, is it? Faith isn't sort of crossing your fingers and wishing for the best. Uh, It's not the line from Oklahoma, Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a wonderful feeling. Everything's going my way. That's not faith. Uh, Faith isn't a feeling. And it's not mindless optimism, as some people sort of see it. Uh, Mark Twain once said, faith is believing what you know ain't so. Faith is believing what you know ain't so. Is that faith? Holding your breath and shutting your eyes? That's not belief, is it? That's make-belief. You see, the author says that faith is assurance and conviction. Assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not 
seen, God's unseen promises. That's what faith is. Let me illustrate. Uh, I had faith when I went to Australia on holiday a few weeks back. You know, so when the pilot promises to get me from England to Australia, I have faith that he'll do what he promised. And I proved that I have faith in him because I sat on the aeroplane. It's unseen, isn't it? I don't know that I'm going to get there. But my faith is based on the assurance that the pilot knows what he's doing and that he has the skills to safely get me to my holiday destination. See, for the Christian, our faith is anchored in a God who has the ability to pull through on his promises. And so by faith, we look ahead to the things hoped for. What are we hoping for today? What do we hope for? We hope for the return of Christ. Titus 2.13 says we're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We hope for the resurrection because we've been born to a living hope. We hope for glorification. We hope to reign with Christ, for if we endure, we will also reign with him. The believer's faith gives her or him an inner certainty that all of these things will become our present reality. See, it's not make-believe. It's a certainty. It's a confidence in who God is and what he has said he will do. And the good news is we're not alone in our journey of faith. Uh, Many saints have walked the road before us. Verse 2. For by faith the people of old received their commendation. And that's going to be proved as the chapter unfolds. And notice it's not works that commended the saints. Of course, their faith expressed itself in good works. But it wasn't the works that received God's tick of approval. Verse 2 says it was their faith, which is why they were commended. And faith not only makes the future promises present, it also enlightens our understanding of the cosmos, doesn't it? Look at verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The universe is just staggering in its size and its glories. It has the fingerprints of the divine all over it. God imagined the world as we know it. See, God's not the result of our imagination. We're the result of his Even though we weren't there, we understand that the universe was made by the breath of the Lord. We're not just a random collection of atoms. We're handcrafted by Jesus. Of course, not all people recognize this reality, do they? Scores of people employ scientific methods to deny our Creator. They do the opposite, to deny Him. They're like the piano mice who lived their lives in a large piano. I don't know if you know the story. Uh, The music of the piano came to them and filled all the dark spaces with sound and harmony. At first, the mice were impressed. They drew comfort and wonder from the thought that there was someone who made the music, someone close to them. They loved to consider the great player who they couldn't see. Until one day, a daring mouse uh, climbed up part of the piano and returned very thoughtful. He had found out how the music was made. Wires were the secrets. Tightly stretched wires of different lengths that trembled and vibrated. And so the mice must revise their old beliefs. They couldn't believe in the unseen player anymore. They lived in a purely mechanical and mathematical world. The unseen player was thought of as a myth, though the pianist continued to play. For the believer, those who know the pianist, it's also clear, isn't it? It's also clear. Science is great. I love science. But we have the word of the everlasting God. We don't speculate about these things. We have a faith that leads to understanding, don't we? God spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. And God did it all from nothing, ex nihilo, out of nothing. He didn't have a rabbit or a hat. By faith in God's word, we know for a certainty that every star was handcrafted by God. All ten octillion of them, I'm told. That's a one followed by 28 zeros. God crafted everything seen and unseen by faith. 
So that's the author's brilliant summary. And now he moves to the gallery. He turns to the ancients who lived before the coming of Christ. And we have short, three short points. What does faith look like? Well, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing God's reverent fear. And so let's go for a, a walk through the hero gallery. And uh, let's stop off at the, the first portrait, Abel. Now, he has much to teach us about faith. Acceptable sacrifice, point number one. The stories of Cain and Abel are enigmatic, aren't they? They're mysterious. Uh, you'll find the story in the fourth chapter of Genesis. Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain who went into agriculture, Abel who took up shepherding. Both were religious men. And when it came to worship, each offered their, they brought their offering before the Lord. Abel from his flock, Cain from his field. But God favored Abel's offering and rejected Cain's. Remember, Cain got angry. God rebuked him, but Cain nursed his rage and murdered his brother. And the story ends with tragedy, doesn't it? As Cain's driven away from the presence of the Lord. Steve read out for us, to us before. What's the point in all of that? Well, Augustine has a penetrating insight. He says Cain was the firstborn, and he belonged to the city of men. Abel was born after him, and he belonged to the city of God. Augustine saw that Cain and Abel both represent a radically different approach to God and worship. There was the way of Cain, non-faith, unbelief. The way of man-made religion, in contrast, is the way of Abel, which uh, we're going to read now together in verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. Now, there's a whole lot of debate as to why God rejected Cain and accepted Abel. I'm not going to get into all that discussion, but one thing is certain. Hebrews tells us that Abel approached God by faith, which, mean Cain, which means that Cain did not, you see? The problem wasn't that Cain brought fruit and veg and Abel brought a lamb. Cain approached God with his own ingenuity, his own thinking. But it's not up to us, is it, to decide how we're to approach God. It's not up to us to come to God on our own terms. That's what different religions do, isn't it, when you think about them? They come up with clever ways to make themselves acceptable before God, and they all have different rituals, laws, and rules, and it's guesswork. What should we do? Do we wear vestments? Do we light a candle? Do we say the rosary? Do we fill our homes with stones? That's what religion is, coming up with different ways to meet with God, but it's not up to us, friends. God decides how we approach him. And he's already decided. Abel somehow knew this, and Abel offered to God an acceptable sacrifice. Abel believed God's word by faith. We don't know how he knew about sacrifice, but it appears that he did know. God must have told him. And he approached God by means of sacrifice. In verse 4, we're told, through which Abel was commended as righteous. Abel declared righteous in God's courtroom. The great judge banged the hammer, righteous. Abel was declared righteous by faith in the blood of sacrifice. And that's why we're told, through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Though he's he's dead, Abel still speaks to you and to me today. Among William Blake's most famous paintings is one depicting the murder of Abel. It's a famous painting. In the background lies Abel's muscular body. It's pale gray in death, lying on the floor. In the foreground, we witness Cain fleeing the scene. He sprints away, but his body is twisted so that he faces the onlooker. His eyes are wide in terror, his mouth gaping in agony. And his hands are stopping his ears to shut out the wail of Abel's blood screaming from the grounds. See, in Genesis, Abel proclaims retribution, justice. But for the believer, Abel proclaims justification by faith. 
He sweetly calls us to a profound witness that we too can be declared righteous by faith in the blood of a substitute. Abel says there is a way to God, and that way is through a lamb. See, we need to take on board what Abel teaches us about faith. We dare not bring anything to God until we bring the blood of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way. No one can come to me. No one can come to the Father except through me. See, Jesus is the sacrifice through which we can approach God. All other approaches are doomed to fail. This is the message the author of Hebrews has been drumming home from the beginning. In chapter 9, verse 28, he says, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. You and I have fallen from our Creator. We've estranged ourselves from Him because of sin. And there's only one door, one way back, isn't there? And it's through the shedding of blood. It's through the sacrifice that God has provided. That's what Easter is all about. See, Jesus dies to be the access point through which we can come to God. The cross is the door. That is how we approach God. God becomes our Father in and through the cross. It's like the wardrobe in Narnia. You go through that wardrobe and you enter the new world of Narnia. We go through the cross to enter a new world that God has prepared for those who trust in His Son. So that's the first portrait in the gallery. Abel gives us a glimpse of faith, drawing near to God through an acceptable sacrifice. Well, as we move along, we come to the second portrait. Uh, We look up now and we see a man called Enoch. And uh, Enoch's faith is expressed in pleasing God. Uh, That's point number two, pleasing God. And if you thought that Cain and Abel were a bit of a mystery... Uh, I'm pretty sure Enoch takes the cake, doesn't he? He is extremely mysterious. He was the long, a long-lived anti uh, I can't even say the word, anti-Diluvian. There we go. That is people who lived before the flood and lived for incredible ages. Uh, Enoch lived for 365 years. Just so we can grasp how long that is, if, if Enoch's life ended in 1992, he would have been born in 1627. <laughs> the year before Salem was founded by the Pilgrim Fathers, the year Francis Bacon published the New Atlantis in London. He would have lived through the age of the Puritans, the age of the Great Awakening. He would have lived through the Enlightenment, the Napoleonic Wars, the Industrial Revolution, World War I, World War II, all the way up until 1992. You get the picture? He lived a pretty long life. And his 300 years were given to righteous living in the midst of the worst evil that's ever occurred on the planet. The evil that resulted in the flood. Enoch shows us how to live for eternity. Like all the heroes of Hebrews 11, Enoch lived for the world to come, didn't he? Look at verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. It's a lovely little sentence, isn't it? Having pleased God. It's not a bad thing to have written on your tombstone, is it? I'd love that Daniel Barden lived having pleased God. That would be a good tune to your life. Enoch walked with God. This suggests that it's a a pattern of his life. It wasn't a one-off. He was in fellowship constantly with God. That's the meaning of life, isn't it? We were made to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And that is what Enoch is doing. That's how he lived out his days. He walked with God in intimate fellowship until one day God said, You are coming home with me. And they sent out the search parties to find him. But he was never seen again. Why? Well, because God had taken him. This is the pattern for future Christians, isn't it? So when Jesus returns, Jesus will snatch us up to himself. And they will no longer walk on the earth. I'm not talking about a rapture where Jesus takes us away for seven years. 
Uh, when Jesus snatches us up to be with him, we will descend with him and the, end, the world will end as we know it. Uh, but there, there is the pattern here, isn't there? The world's coming to a close. And Enoch shows us how to escape the cycle of death. There is a way out of the pattern of death we see all around us. There is a way out of the pattern of death of Genesis 5. The way to escape that death is faith. Enoch walked by faith. Uh, we already know what it means, um, what that meant for him, because we've read the first few verses of Hebrews 11. Enoch trusted in the promises of God. He, he held on to God's promises in Christ. He looked forward with expectant hope, and he was declared as having pleased God. But it's not just the previous verses. We also know how Enoch pleased God, because we're told in verse 6. Uh, this verse was Calvin's key text for defining faith. Really important verse, if you want to understand what faith is. Here we go. Verse 6, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is the kind of faith that Enoch exemplified. There's two parts, isn't there? First, faith believes that God exists. It's, ov it's obvious, but it's important, isn't it? You can't please God if you don't believe in his existence. There's no greater dishonor to, to someone, to anyone, than to ignore their existence, is there? Imagine if I, if I came home to, to my wife one evening and just decided to ignore her, pretend that she doesn't exist. It's incredibly disrespectful. Faith believes that God is who he says he is. It believes that he exists. But faith must go further than that, friends. And this is where Calvin is, is really helpful. Calvin said, faith must be more than believing God exists because demons believe that God exists. We can hardly say that they have faith. The key is the second part of the verse. It's drawing near to the one who rewards those who seek him. Rewards those who seek him. Faith draws me to God, not just because he exists, but because he has promised to do me good in Christ. That's what faith is. Because there, there are things that God says that pushes us away. For example, if you eat of this fruit in the, in the garden, you will die. That's not a promise that draws you to the mercies of God in Christ. It's a word that promises death upon disobedience. Faith is a drawing near to God's promises. You know you have faith when you come close to God with assurance that he will bless you because of the work of his son. And notice that without faith, it's not possible to please God. You see that there? You can do all kinds of nice things. But Hebrews 11 is saying, if you don't have faith, you're not pleasing God. In the freedom of a Christian, Luther writes, what is greater contempt and rebellion against God than to not trust his promises? He says, isn't that making God a liar and doubting that God is truthful? Rightly then, does God see unbelief as the root of all sin? Enoch wasn't delivered from death because he was a decent bloke. He was delivered from death because he had faith in God's words. And in the same way, Luther says, our faith will be reckoned to us as righteousness if we have faith too. So we've taken a look at the first two heroes of faith. Uh, Abel shows his faith by coming to God for an acceptable sacrifice. Uh, Enoch shows his faith by believing that God exists and trusting that God rewards those who seek him. And then finally, uh, we're going to stop off at the portrait of Noah. So point number three is reverent fear. That's what faith looks like for Noah, reverent fear. Uh, call me Captain Obvious, but it's not an easy task to build a boat the size of a football stadium. That's how big the ark is, by the way. You, you can read the, the measurements in Genesis 6. It's a tall order. It took, I think people, scholars suggest it took 100 years. And Noah was pleading with people, wasn't he? Noah implored people to repent of their sins. In, in 2 Peter 2.5, Noah is called a, a preacher of righteousness. 
You can imagine the conversations, can't you? What are you doing today, Noah? Building an ark. What's an ark? What's the Lord's provision for, for you to escape God's wrath? God's judgment's coming and, and you need to find refuge in this ark. And, and the years rolled on and laughter turned to scorn, hatred and anger. When's this day coming, Noah? Doesn't appear that anything's changing. Come on, you're a fool. I don't believe in the so-called future events. And they mocked until the rain fell and the laughter stopped. And only Noah and his family were saved. Out of the entire human race, only eight were saved. We teach this to our children at Sunday school <laughs> with bright rainbows and pretty colors and happy animals. It's not the scene we find in Genesis, is it? Imagine, imagine the screams. That's great. Scores of people banged on the ark to no avail because the door was shut. They were too late. But Noah was saved. Look at verse 7. By faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And notice the parallel between this verse and the first. Assurance is the thing, uh, is, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Remember, the conviction of things not seen. No one couldn't see the future. Hadn't arrived, had it? All he had was a warning and a promise. Invisible promises. God said, I'll flood the world. You build a boat and get in it. And Noah got to work, preaching and laboring. He did uh, my job and Tim's all in one. This is what the fear of the Lord looks like. So if you're, if you're Noah and you hear that God's about to flood the world... Faith looks like responding in reverent fear, doesn't it? Fear didn't mean that Noah was scared of God. That's not what fear means. It, it, doesn't mean, it didn't cause him to flee from God, did it? It caused him to find refuge in God. When confronted with God's judgment against sin, Noah ran towards the only place of safety, the promises of God. And by his actions, his family was saved. But what does it mean by this he condemned the world? One commentator said, Noah condemned the world by his faith because he showed that he belonged to God. He didn't give himself over to the evil of the day, but the world was condemned because it wasn't in a right relationship with God. I don't think that this means we ought to take a, a cue from Noah, stand on a box in the town and just tell people how bad they are for a hundred years. Um, this isn't a verse to go and make people feel rubbish. Remember, Noah preached salvation, didn't he? That's what he preached, salvation. But part of that message is a message of judgment. People needed to hear about the judgment to come. See, judgment comes to all those who don't find their refuge in God's ark, the Lord Jesus Christ. Noah ended up the same as Abel and Enoch. Uh, he ended up justified by faith alone. Uh, justification means to be declared righteous. This is where God looks at you and he looks at me and he clothes us with the perfection of his son. And he takes away our sin on that cross. And he declares us guiltless, righteous. Guiltless and righteous. And the story of Noah is a picture, isn't it? It's a picture. The flood's a picture of a much worse judgment that is coming. It points to the day when the world will be engulfed, not in water, but in fire. And those who are saved will take refuge in Jesus Christ, the ark of God. And people laugh about this today, just as they did in Noah's day. So you, you'll be called a fundamentalist if you believe in this. I want you to realize that. People scoff. <laughs> you really believe Jesus is going to return one day? Really? It's been 2,000 years. Where's this coming? Looks like you're believing a load of rubbish. 
and, and we're mocked for it. But friends, another descent will come. Not rain, but the descent of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring the wrath of Almighty God. That day is coming. But as Christians, we're not skittish because we have taken refuge in Jesus, the one who exhausted the wrath of God for all who would believe. It's a hard truth to swallow, isn't it? I think it's hard, believing this stuff, but God's wrath must surely fall. Because deep down, don't, don't we all long for justice to be done? We do, don't we? Who wants evil to go on unpunished forever? God must judge because he is good. The world's in a dark place, isn't it? Spiritually. The kings and trio used to sing, they're, they're rioting in Africa, they're starving in Spain. There are hurricanes in Florida and Texas needs rain. The whole world is seething with unhappy souls. The French hate the Germans, the Germans hate the Poles. The Poles hate the Yugoslavs, South Africans hate the Dutch. And I don't think I like anybody very much. The world's full of darkness. But into this dark world, a light has dawned. And there's a light wherever there is faith. See, the light comes from those who believe God's word. Those who are granted such faith are graced with righteousness and are given a perfect standing before him. See, this faith is a faith that delivers from the judgment that is coming. Yes, the world's full of darkness, but the light of the gospel continues to shine. There's still hope, isn't there? While today is called today, there's still hope. Let me conclude with three brief points of application. Very brief. Number one, draw near to God through the sacrifice of Christ. Draw near to God through the sacrifice of Christ. Don't come to God on your own terms. If you sin in some drastic measure this week, don't think, oh, now I need to do just a bunch of good things to prove myself. Don't do that. I think we like to just sit in our own filth, don't we? And we try and earn our way back to God. When you feel guilty, remind yourself of the cross, that God knew all of your sin. And he still sent Jesus. Then run to him and sing your favorite hymn. Whatever that hymn might be, that'll do your soul a load of good. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. Number one, draw near to God through the sacrifice of Christ. Number two, live a life pleasing to God. A walking with God's heart in a world that will want to pull you off track all the time. Imagine how hard it was for Enoch. Imagine the temptations that he had to compromise. If you think that we've got it bad, I'm sure he had it worse. Evil stared him in the face in ways we can't imagine. And yet he, he walked with God in sweet fellowship. How are we going with that? How do we do that now? Well, we open up our Bibles. We meet with God in his words. We walk by the Spirit in prayer, holding on to the gospel. We gather with the saints and enjoy the Lord together. The world will try and pull you off course, but faith looks to please God as we walk in his ways. And three, live in reverent fear. This can take on loads of different forms. Uh, for Noah, his reverent fear led to him building the ark, and it led to his gospel proclamation, didn't it? Um, so warn those around us. Warn those we love. Warn people that judgment is coming, and that they can be saved, not by getting into a boat, but by, by trusting in Jesus. That Jesus has taken away God's judgment against sin. Warn people. Hebrews 11 is a creed, isn't it? It's a creed. It's about faith, what we believe. And Hebrews 11, 1 to 7 would have us say, 
I believe that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for sins. I believe that Jesus has promised to take me to be with him forever. I believe that God has set a day when he'll judge the world in righteousness through the one whom he has raised from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we're called to believe. As we close, people say today, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're good. Have you heard people say that? They downplay belief, don't they? It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're good. But what this chapter is telling us is it doesn't matter how good you are. If you don't believe, you're in trouble. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Let's draw near now in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we live in a world that makes it really difficult to believe. We live in a world that makes faith really hard because... Faith is trusting in unseen promises. Um, And the world has so many shiny toys that it flashes before our eyes. And we can be super distracted by them. And so we pray that you would help us to gain encouragement from these three, we could call them heroes of the faith. These three men that decided to walk by faith in the unseen promises. We've got it much easier than them as we have seen that how you fulfilled your promises in Christ. We can look back and see it all fulfilled. And so grow us in faith. Help us to to walk by faith in approaching you through Jesus, pleasing you with our walk, and living in reverent fear. Lord God, if there's any here or online that does not believe, oh, that you would plant belief in their hearts to see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing they might have life in his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to respond to God's word by singing by faith. And uh, we we did sing it this morning, and we're going to sing it a whole load more times over the next few weeks, since uh, I think it would be criminal not to. So please stand, and let's sing by faith.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.